The king of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever, and he is mine forever. Where streams of living water flow, And so he leadeth, and where the verdant pastures grow, with food celestial feedeth, never failing, ruler of my heart, everlasting, lover of my soul. Love my shepherd is often foolish, oft I strayed, but yet in love he sought me and on his shoulder gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. In death's dark veil, I fear no ill. With thee, dear Lord, beside me, thy rod and staff, my comfort still, thy cross before to guide me, never failing, ruler of my heart, everlasting, lover of my soul on the mountain high, or in the King of love, my shepherd is. The King of love, my shepherd is. Never failing, ruler of my heart, everlasting, lover of my soul on the mountain high or in the valley low. The King of love, my shepherd is. King of love, my shepherd is. And so through all the length of days, thy goodness faileth never. Good shepherd, may I sing your praise within your house forever. Within your house forever. worship. Welcome everyone to worship this morning. Welcome to you who are joining us online for worship this morning. We are so glad you are here and we are going to begin uh, by also singing. Uh, if you're here, number 622, let's rise in body or spirit. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
Will you pray with me? Oh, gracious God, we invite you into our worship this morning. Literally, Lord, you need no invitation, but we need to acknowledge that we do invite you in. We open our hearts and minds to your presence in this place. And we ask you to be such a tangible part of our worship today that we cannot ignore your presence. Creator God, Brother Jesus, Holy Spirit, come and be present in our worship this day. It's the power of Christ that we pray. Amen. All right, let's have the kiddos come forward for our children's moment with Miss Janet. Just sit right there. Yep. Just anywhere on that bench. <clears throat> We're going to talk about a couple of brothers today, so let's find out. Anybody have a brother? Yeah. Uh, you have a brother? How about sisters? Anybody have sisters? Yeah. Do you like those brothers and sisters? Uh, sometimes. So let's find out. <clears throat> How many of you are the oldest? <gasps> Got an oldest. Okay. Yeah. All right, and then how many, anybody the youngest? Ooh, look at this. So, do you think because you're the youngest that you get more advantages or you get away with more things because you're the youngest? Now, see, the oldest one's going, yeah, yeah. I'm the, I'm the youngest. Anybody, okay, all right. Well, unfortunately, I'm not the oldest, I'm not the youngest. I was one of those middle children. And I have to say, I thought that oldest one got a lot of privilege because she always got to do things that I wanted to do and I couldn't do because I wasn't the oldest. And I have to say, though, really, I was the youngest for a few years, so there's almost like eight year, over eight years between my youngest sister and myself. So I kind of had the advantage of being the youngest for a while. So I have to tell you that my nose got out of joint when that youngest one came along. I did not like being that middle child. It just seemed that if anything happened... The finger got pointed at me because the oldest one wouldn't do it. She was the oldest, and the youngest one was too cute. She wouldn't do it. So it had to be the one in the middle. So I had a rough, a rough childhood there. So <laughs> the, the two brothers we're going to talk about today are even kind of special brothers because they were twins. Can you imagine having someone who, is, who may look like you or who's the same age as you or who, you know, was born the same, has the same birthday as you? Well... You know, even if there's twins, one of them has to be born first. So one of them has to be the oldest, and the other one had to be the youngest. And back in biblical time, if you were born first, you got a lot of privileges later on down the road. When uh, the, the, the home that you lived on, when it got divided up, you got more because you were the oldest. If there was money, you got more because you were the oldest. If there were animals, you got more because you were the oldest. So how do you think that youngest one felt? Not, Not good. You're right. <laughs> That's good, Cole. Happy they don't have to feed as many animals. That might be. <laughs> you're, you're probably right there. So anyway, these two are. You have to take care of five pets. That's five too many. Or at least four too many. Wow. Wow. You have got a lot to do. Well, these two were doing fine, except there was another problem in, long, in that the oldest one was like the father, and the father kind of liked him more. And the younger one, the mother liked more. So they kind of had a pet. And so they were always pushing that child, you know, to be the, the best at everything. And um, Esau was the oldest. He liked to hunt he liked to be out in the woods, just like his dad. And Jacob was the younger one, and he was more of the homebody. And, and believe it or not, Jacob could cook in biblical times. You don't think about men cooking back then, but Jacob could make a pretty good stew and, and bake bread. So, you know, he was his mother's favorite. So they were getting to the age where it was time for the property to be divided up, and Jacob got jealous of his brother. So one day Esau had been out hunting, and he must have not been able to find anything because he came home and he was really hungry. And Jacob had made this stew that smelled really good, and he had this bread. And so Esau wanted some stew. Well, Jacob said, okay, 
I'll give you a bowl of soup, soup, but you have to sell me your birthright. I can't believe that Esau fell for that. It was like giving away all of his privileges for a combo meal from McDonald's. <laughs> but he did it. He sold his birthright. Well, Jacob's going like, I am now the special one. But there was a second stage to this. You had to also get your father's blessing. Well, it's interesting that they were twins, but they really weren't anything alike. Esau was really, are you ready for this? He was hairy. I guess he must have had a lot of hair on his arms and on his neck and his face. Jacob wasn't. So how was he going to get his dad's blessing? How was he going to fool his dad? Well, fortunately for Jacob, his father's eyesight had gotten bad. So he couldn't tell by looking at them which one you know, he was going to be talking to or giving the blessing to. But he could tell by feel. So would you believe it that Jacob's mother tricked her own husband into giving Jacob the blessing by tying on some goat skins onto his arms and around his neck so that when his father felt, he thought it was Esau. So he gave Jacob the blessing. A little while later, Esau shows up and he wants his dad's blessing. And his dad says, well, I already gave it. And then he realized what had happened. But he couldn't take it back. So, you know, Esau made a bad choice. And you wonder, why would God allow him to do that? But that's just it. God allows us to make choices. And sometimes we're human enough that we don't make the right choice. And Esau lost out. Not terribly. He still got property. He still got animals. But he, didn't, he wasn't the favorite, I guess you would say. So, you know, sometimes when, you come, when a decision is facing you, you need to think about, what are the consequences down that road? Am I giving something away just for a combo meal from McDonald's, or had I better think about this twice? All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for giving us the freedom to make our own choices. And we thank you most of all for guiding us toward making good choices and for helping us when we ask. Please stand beside us when we face tough choices and help us to make those good decisions. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, you can go to worship and wonder. I failed to ask for yellow cards <laughs> at the beginning. Uh, so does anyone have a yellow card with a prayer request or concern that I haven't gotten yet? Well, I guess that works out then. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize for that. Uh, all right. Uh, we do have some prayer, uh, some praises and some prayer concerns. Oh, you do have one. Thank you. All right. Oh, cool. We'll keep that one right there. Uh, Dennis Fulford asked for prayers for Regina Brewer uh, Diefenbauer uh, at the passing of her grandson. Uh, we want to keep Marge Carmichael in our prayers at Ron's passing uh, this week. And uh, there will be a graveside-only service Tuesday at 11 o'clock at what, New South Park. New, thank you. I get very confused. I haven't lived here long enough, I guess. New South Park Cemetery. It's the one right across from Neil and Summer. That, I know where it is. I just can never remember the name of it. Yes, thank you. New South Park a cemetery at 11 o'clock. So, and then uh, also we want to keep Roberta Mikesell in our prayers as she had a fall and now has a broken arm, shoulder area. Um, and then also we'd ask for prayers for our son Derek who's experiencing some back pain. And we have a couple of praises. Nancy Trammell lifts up praise um, as Kellen Gilbert Klaus Drake was born July 8th. Uh, her first great-grandson, so that's exciting. Yay! And uh, Julie Presley lifts up a praise that Savannah had a successful move, move but asked for continued prayers uh, for her new life path, and we can certainly do that. All right, so we want to keep those on our hearts and minds as we move into a time of prayer together, and uh, we, of course, will close this time with the Lord's Prayer. Will you bow with me? Lord of life, you have sown seeds of your creative nature throughout our world. 
You have filled the earth with beauty and wonder. You have blessed us with families. You have made us aware of our worth in you. And so, O oh God, we lift our songs of praise from our hearts. Holy One, you have placed us in communities and called us to love. You have given us music, imagination, memories. You have given us work, technology, inventions, and skills. You have given us unlimited resources through your Holy Spirit. You have given us grace to give each other hope. You give us so very much, O oh God. And in return, we give you our worship and praise. The greatest gift of all, you gave us your Son and all things in him. Holy One, as we come before you with hearts of praise and worship, some of us also come, Lord, with concerns on our shoulders and, and heavy hearts. And so, Lord, we want to pause just now to quietly and individually lift up our concerns to you. Holy One, we are so grateful for how you uh, care for us in the midst of struggle, in the midst of grief, in the midst of pain. You are there as our support, as our, our rock, as our guide. You are our everything. And that is why, oh God, we gather to praise and worship you. And so we pause just now to quietly and individually lift up our individual praises to you. Thank you, Holy One, for all the many, many ways you bless us and show up in our lives just to say, I love you, and I'm paying attention to your life. Thank you for how you care enough about us to call us into relationship with you, not only in this life, but through all eternity. We give you all the praise, O oh God, as you speak to each of us as your beloved child but also call us to come together as the body of Christ. So now we take our individual voices and we lift them up in the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is here. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled, his tender words I hear, and resting on his goodness, 
I lose my doubt and fear, though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to him. From care he sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Thank you, Dennis and Sean. That was beautiful, and I know that's a favorite uh, song and a favorite message of many of us, so thank you so much. Our um, scripture today is from Genesis 25, verses 27 and 28. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Sibling rivalry. Those two words seem to go together so very well, don't they? Well, maybe it's just because that was the house I grew up in. <laughs> Uh, my siblings were 6, 9, and 11 years older than me, and it seemed like to me that they were always fighting with each other. But I remember one time uh, specifically that uh, we were going to play baseball together, <clears throat> but my sister, who was 6 years older than me, said I was too young. And I was probably fairly young at the time, uh, but old enough to remember the story. Because uh, <laughs> our oldest brother, who was 11 years older, he was going to be the pitcher. And he said, no, she can play. And my, other sister, my sister said, no, she can't. And my sister shoved me out of the way and took the bat and put it up on her shoulder and, and went up to the plate. She was ready. So my brother, you know, he, he eyed her there at the plate. He visually measured the distance, and he did the wind-up, and he threw the ball right at her face and broke her nose. Yes, intentionally. <laughs> and then said, now can she play? So, oh, that's one of the milder stories. <laughs> oh, the stories I could tell of sibling rivalry in my house. Uh, according to the Cleveland Clinic in an online article I saw from them uh, May 8th of this year, sibling rivalry describes the inevitable <laughs> competition and animosity that occurs between siblings. This kind of relationship happens most often in siblings close in age, it says, but it can also occur when larger age gaps are present, as well as between siblings who aren't even blood related. Rather than a one-time dispute over who's getting better grades or that highly coveted last piece of Halloween candy, Sibling rivalry tends to flare up often, consistently, and sometimes without any known common denominator. Any of you who have siblings or are the parent of siblings, you're like, yes, exactly. <laughs> well, today we are uh, meeting the twin sons of Isaac and Rebecca, 
who experienced sibling rivalry even back when they were womb mates. Will you pray with me? Oh, Holy One, we come uh, seeking, uh, seeking you this morning in this space, and we ask you to speak to us. Speak to us through your Holy Scriptures. Speak to us in ways that will help us and direct us. Speak to us, O oh God, in ways that will change us. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In Christ we pray. Amen. Family reunions are a, a space that give us the opportunity to get to know extended family, right? And so we're going through this series this summer uh, called Family Reunion, where we're getting to know our faith family ancestors. And uh, we started off learning that from the beginning of time, uh, the perfect family, um, God, right, our creator, uh, Christ, and the Holy Spirit were all together from the very beginning of time. They are the perfect family. They have shown us uh, what family can be, uh, what we can strive for, what it means to be family. But they also teach us that family is more about uh, not so much about how we're related, but more about how we are relational. Then we met Abraham and Sarah, uh, God's perfectly chosen family that were far from perfect. <laughs> and uh, God promised them that through them would come these great nations and the entire world would be blessed, right? But several years go by, and there's no son for these two. At some point, they take matters into their own hands. They, they kind of lose faith in uh, God's promise. But finally, they do recognize God's faithfulness as these two have a son in their old age, and that son is Isaac. Last week, we saw Abraham send his slave off to find a wife for son Isaac, but the, the, the slave first was smart enough to cover the entire task in prayer, and so he was successful. And uh, when he brings Rebecca back, as soon as Isaac sees her, the scriptures tell us that he loved her. And so in our story today, now Isaac and Rebecca are becoming parents. And if you want to follow along, you'll want to open up to Genesis 25. That is where our story begins. Now, much like uh, the parents, the, the couple here, Isaac and Rebecca, have been married quite a while. And Rebecca, like Sarah, is uh, childless. She has not been able to have children. Isaac apparently learned from his parents' mistakes and did not try to take matters into his own hands. Instead, he covers Rebecca with prayer. And so after 20 years of being childless, she is able, it says, the scripture says, and the Lord granted his prayer and his wife Rebecca conceived. Conceived she did, twin boys, twin boys. She's doubly blessed, right? Because she's been prayed over a couple of times. It's quite the blessing. Scriptures tell us that the children struggled together within her, and she said, if it's to be this way, why do I live? It must have been pretty bad. <laughs> they started early. <laughs> so she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. And she probably got this information from a prophet, actually. So um, many look at this particular verse, and they like to translate it as saying that God then has a preference for the younger child. But it doesn't actually say that. Uh, we want to remember that God is an eternal being, right? Our God exists outside of our understanding of time and space. And so God knows the future. So perhaps God does prefer the younger, or perhaps God is simply stating the facts here. At any rate, these twin boys are born. The first out, of course, then would be the oldest. And that child is red and ruddy and hairy. And thus, he gets the name Esau, which means hairy. But his twin is right on his heels, literally. <laughs> Jacob comes out holding on to his brother's heel, as if he's trying to pull him back and get ahead of him right from the get-go. So Esau has this name, Harry, right? 
And Jacob's is not much better. <laughs> it means to defraud or deceive or displace. There you go. Uh, and his name carries an idea that he will be the one who will displace people, um, that he will replace or unseat someone. And as it turns out, that someone will be his brother. And so the competition begins <laughs> between these two boys. Also in the Cleveland uh, Clinic article, it says, the feeling of competition is at the root of sibling rivalry, explained psychologist Dr. Susan Albers. Not all competition is negative. It can make you work harder. But in sibling dynamics, it can become toxic and damaging when it is taken too far or fostered by parents. And what did our text today tell us? <laughs> when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. In other words, more of a homebody. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. We have some unhealthy sibling dynamics here fostered by the parenting. Now, I've always thought, for crying out loud, these were twins. I mean, they're basically born at the same time. Can't they just share things? But that's not the way the ancient laws and culture worked, <laughs> right? Uh, the firstborn, there must be a person that is the firstborn. Uh, that person receives a greater share of the inheritance, as Janet was telling us, uh, uh, more social power. It's called the birthright. And this one, so there must be one that is designated as the oldest, as the elder son. I also often wondered, did Rebecca tell Jacob about what God had told her? Like when he was younger, did he know that he was supposedly the chosen one, that he supposedly was the, the preferred one? Did he know that he could possibly grow up and he could have God's promise as part of his life? That he could inherit his grandfather's promise from God? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know if Rebecca favored Jacob because of what God had said to her or just because of his delightful personality. We just don't know. But if we continue reading in Genesis 25, the boys are still at it. Once, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff. This is a play on his name. <clears throat> For I am famished. Therefore, they called him Edom, which means red. That's the, that will be the country that is named after him as Edom. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Edom means red. Red body, red name, red stew. That's where we get that. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Oh, how dramatic. <laughs> Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. So he wasn't too far gone, was he? Uh, thus Esau despised his birthright. He gave his birthright away, just like Janet said, just because he was dying of hunger. He was not dying of hunger. This is a hasty hunger and another brother's uh, still grabbing at what he wants, right? And I wonder, did Esau despise his birthright because he always had? Had he always despised it? Had he always seen it as worthless? Or does he despise it now because it is Jacob's? The birthright was a very special honor for the oldest child, the oldest son. The first one born was given this very special honor. And he sells it for a bowl of stew for this very temporary pleasure, this thing of the world. Esau shows complete disregard, disregard for the spiritual blessing and the leadership expectations that would have come with his birthright. We jump ahead to Genesis 27, and here is the story uh, that 
uh, Janet was also referring to where um, Jacob comes into his father to confuse him and pretend he is actually Esau. So Rebecca and Jacob do outsmart Isaac and Esau so that Jacob, through his uh, deceit, through his trickery, he gets his father's blessing and, of course, with it, the covenant promise from God. And here again, God's role in all of this is not real straightforward. Uh, did God actually choose Jacob from the very beginning? When God told Rebecca that the older would uh, answer to the younger, did she start then figuring out how she was going to make that happen? Was it preference, or was it just the inevitable of what would come to pass? Did she scheme with her son because she felt like she had to make God's promise or God's word come to fruition, taking things into her own hands again, if you will? We don't know. We don't know if she loved him more, and so that's why she worked for it harder. We really don't know. None of the answers are clear in the scripture, as is quite often the case in scripture. That's why we're encouraged to read it, <laughs> study it, and come to our own conclusions. One thing is clear. Neither of these young men shows great character <laughs> in these stories, right? Uh, Esau is strong and likable. Although, in this time and place in the world, people who were excessively hairy were looked at as backward. And he was foolish, right? He chooses his hunger over God's promise. But to say that Jacob's behavior was morally questionable is really kind of an understatement here. <laughs> really? I mean, some of the things that he has done. Uh, but he is conniving and grasping, but... He does long for that birthright so that he can serve God through this promise of God to the family. Our faith family teaches us some things not to do <laughs> among siblings and how to handle sibling rivalry. But the Cleveland Clinic has some really great tips on how to deal with sibling rivalry and also how to deal with relationships in general. They tell us to stay calm, quiet, and in control. And why is that? Because if you keep cool, those that you are dealing with will also keep cool. In the, chan in the, in the case of dealing with your children, it shows that you can have conversation and uh, work these things out in a calm manner. They say create cooperative environments. Avoid comparing your children, favoring one over the other. I think uh, Rebecca and Isaac might have needed this list, uh, <laughs> or, in, or even encouraging competition between them. Instead, create opportunities for cooperation and, uh, comprise and compromise by empowering them to play together. Uh, I know I, I've been so impressed with my uh, daughter-in-law. They play games all the time, but they don't play to win. They just play cooperative games and, and games just for fun, and, it, and it's really uh, neat to see that. Um, explore their individual curiosities and share time with them. Uh, share your time with them. And remember how you and your spouse <laughs> resolve conflict is also teaching them something. Third, they say celebrate individuality. Children are less likely to fight if they feel that each of them, uh, if you appreciate each of them as an individual. Avoid labeling as that causes uh, expectations and, and a reason to try and live into something that they have been labeled. Play fun plan fun family time. Doing activities are great ways for children to bond and share uh, positive memories together. Treat kids fairly, but not equally. I know my parents used to say, well, th that's what your brother got, that's what you're getting. It was always equal. Everything's equal. Everything's equal. But that isn't actually always fair. Fair doesn't always mean equal, right? Uh, punishments and rewards should be tailored to your child's individual needs. It, it, like with our particular sons, there was one that if I took away um, screen time, that would have been very, very effective. The other one would have been like, thank you, I'll, I didn't want to watch TV anyway. So, you know, you have to tailor it based on their needs, desires, and what's going to be most effective. Remember, it takes two to tangle. 
Avoid the blame game. Both parties have been involved here, right? <laughs> a good way to get the root cause of conflict is to sit everyone down together, uh, talk about how everyone involved is feeling, and find helpful ways to manage that conflict better in the future. Listen. Although their emotions are not an excuse for negative or aggressive behavior, children are more likely to cooperate if they feel they're being heard. And that is true of all of us. We all want to be heard, right? So anytime we have conflict, whether it's between kids or friends or whatever, if we just take time to talk things out and make sure everyone feels heard, it can go such a long way. Give children problem-solving skills. Demonstrate how they might compromise share or approach a similar situation in a more positive and appropriate way. Make discipline private. That never happened at my house. It was very public. <laughs> Making the conversation public can shame a child in front of their siblings, creating uh, greater animosity between them. I think my father's idea was, if you see me punish this one, you'll be too afraid to do this <laughs> because you'll get the same thing. <laughs> Have a family meeting. Gather the family and talk and, uh, to give everybody a chance to say what they want to say. It's also an opportunity to establish house rules uh, that family members can agree to follow. Having very clear family rules is key, says Dr. Albers. This allows you to point to the rule rather than choose which child is right. And I know Linda and I have talked about this um, in working with you, using the think system, which they use over there at the Haven. In other words, if it's not true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, or kind, it's not said. And if it is, then you're told to think. And uh, like with the youth group, then you, you pause and you let them create the rules around, you know, what should it look like if someone, you know, disobeys that, that concept. Um, and so when, once they own those rules, then it makes a really big difference in how they want to follow them. If they've created them, it's so much more important to them. And so this can be done in family groups. This can be done in, in all kinds of groups. We used to do this in, in youth group um, where I was years ago, and it was very effective. So I think there's some excellent information here, and I wish we could go back in time and give this to Isaac and Rebecca, <laughs> but we can't. Instead, we look at their life and see that in spite of the faults of this particular family, God worked anyway. This family was totally dysfunctional, and yet God worked through them to fulfill God's promise. And I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. That gives me hope for my dysfunctional family, for our dysfunctional families, uh, that God can still use us as well, despite what we may have lived through or been through or are currently working through. There is always hope. Dr. Albers says, nothing makes a parent happier than harmony in their family, particular bet particularly between their children. The good news is many families can work through the rivalry and turn conflict into deep connection. And we actually see Esau and Jacob many years later working through their conflict and coming together when it's time to bury their father. So really things do work out. Um, but each of us then can, can work towards that as well, right? To, to have this kind of harmony in our families. So may parents be happy in our personal families, in our church family, and in the family of God. Will you pray with me? Oh, Holy One, we give you thanks for family. There are times, Lord, that we wonder why in the world did you put us in this family? But a pastor told me one time, Lord, that you have a, a wonderful sense of humor and that you've put us into family so that we'll learn to get along with people we would normally never associate with. <laughs> Lord, I think sometimes that's true. But we thank you, Lord, how you open our hearts and minds to each other, whether we are connected through blood, relation, or just because you've put us into the family of God together. Help us to always keep our hearts and minds open and show your love and grace to one another. It's the power of Christ that we pray. Amen. I think I mentioned recently about my uh, 
my nephew, after my sister passed away, wanted us to all, my brothers and I, to come around the dining room table and tell all the stories, because he wanted to hear all the stories. I don't know if he realized how many of those stories were going to share sibling rivalry, because <laughs> we told the, the baseball story and a, and a few others as well. But what's so fascinating is as we sat there telling those stories, we were laughing about them. Not so much when they happened, but <laughs> several years later we could look back and laugh because our relationships had come so much further as we had learned to live as family and learned to be more relational. When we come to this table, Christ invites us. We are all part of God's family. He calls each and every one of us his beloved child. And so that brings us all into the same amazing family. Christ sets the table so all are welcome. Doesn't matter if you're a member of this church or any church. If you seek the love and grace that Christ so freely gives, you are welcome at the feast. Let us sing to prepare our hearts for communion number 608, I Would Be True. Thank you. Jesus and his disciples came and gathered there in a large upper room to celebrate the Passover together. And as he looked around that table, he saw a couple sets of brothers. I often wondered, why in the world would Jesus recruit brothers? <laughs> I know how siblings are in these kinds of matters. And yet he knew that there was something special about each of them, each one at that table. And the fact that they were brothers and going to share his word was also going to show how important our relationships are. Jesus knew that all of them had become family around that table. And he knew then how hard they were going to take the loss of the one that was so dear to each and every one of them. Because he knew everything that was before him. He knew about the mock trial overnight. He, he knew about the cross and how horrific that would be. He knew about the grave and how by that time his family around that table would think all was lost. But he also knew about resurrection. He knew about the power of resurrection, the gift of light and love that that would bring into the world as a way to bring the whole family back together, the family of humankind. 
the joy of that kept him there for that one last supper. So he stood and he took bread and lifted it to heaven and blessed it. He broke it and he passed it among them. He said, take and eat of this, all of you. This represents my body given in sacrifice for you. I ask that when you do this in the future, you remember me and my love for you. Standing again, he took a cup and he lifted that to heaven and blessed it and passed that among them. And he said, take and drink of this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant. And when you do this, remember me and my love for you. In just a moment, we'll hear some music from Sean. And I'm going to ask you to take of the bread in the bottom of your cup, reminding us that we are each called to this individual relationship with Christ but we're also part of the body of Christ. And so if you would, hold the juice, and we will take that together, reminding us of that family bond. For these gifts, let us pray. With me. Dearest Lord, we thank you that no matter how many times we make mistakes or take the wrong path, you still love us, and you want to teach us the right way to live in harmony with you and with each other. Help us to remember that we don't have to be in competition with others for your love. You love all of us as your dear children. You sent your son Jesus to demonstrate that love. As we come to this communion table today, help us to remember and to acknowledge Christ as the Savior who taught us how to live as you would have us to live and then who gave his life that we might be reconciled to you and to one another. It is Jesus Christ whose life, death, and resurrection we remember as we partake of these emblems of his broken body and shed blood, and it is of your grace poured out over each of us for which we give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Now let us partake as one in the body of Christ. <clears throat> and through his blood we are made new. <clears throat> our cups are empty, but our hearts are filled. Having had this time of communion, we come now to the time in our service where uh, we recognize that God has given us many gifts, blessed us in many ways, and so we take time then to return to God just a portion of what God has given us and ask us to be good stewards of. Please pray with me. Loving God, as we begin this new church year at First Christian Church, we thank you for the blessings you bestow on each of us individually and collectively each and every day, material and spiritual blessings and the blessings of relationships with you and with others. Thank you for giving each of us the blessings of time, talents, and resources with which we can use to bless others and to further your kingdom here on earth. Just now, please bless these offerings that we bring and pledge to you and use them
to further your work here in this church and in our world. Bless the gifts and bless the givers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Our faith in action comes out in lots of different ways. Of course, we welcome any guests that we have here today. We'd ask you to be sure and visit our Welcome Center so we can officially welcome you uh, to worship this morning. And we want to have record of your attendance, everyone's attendance here. So if you uh, would be sure and fill out your connection card. If you haven't already, you can still uh, just drop it in the offering boxes on your way out uh, if you haven't uh, filled those out ahead of time. We appreciate that as we're getting our uh, database up and running again and getting uh, all of our records uh, in order. Uh, reminder that we have women's Bible study um, called Ladies Learning Together, 6 to 7 on Wednesday nights. We'd love to have you join us for that, where we're studying uh, the bad girls of the Bible, if that interests you. <laughs> and you're a lady. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're working to update the church directory. There's one uh, laying over there in the east room. If you double check your information in there, if it's right, just put a check mark. Uh, if it's not, if you would uh, make sure we have updated information there, uh, that would be great. Uh, Camp Sunday is in just a couple weeks. We'll have the youth up here, so that'll be exciting. Always a wonderful Sunday uh, to see the camp, uh, see the kids lead worship, and they'll be uh, sharing with you a lot of what they experienced at camp this year. And uh, then we will follow that with our all-church picnic out at Jimmy Nash Park. So uh, mark your calendars accordingly so you can uh, uh, have lots of fun with us uh, throughout the morning there. Uh, also, we're uh, starting a little class here. We'll be Monday nights um, after community table in August, the 14th, 21st, and 28th, called Empowering Women. Um, so if you have questions about it, uh, feel free to ask. If you have someone you think might... Um, find value in this kind of a class. Uh, there are cards over there in the East Room you can pick up to invite them uh, to join us for that. Uh, and we also had another prayer concern we want to be sure and lift up. Uh, Michelle Walker asked for prayers for Norma's stomach issues, so please keep, keep that prayer in your hearts as well. So my challenge for you this week is to think of all those places that you are in relationship either with your biological siblings or siblings in the family of God. Oh, those. We were talking about those too? Yes, yes we are. <laughs> so our relationships with one another and how we can look at those top 10 uh, ideas of ways that we can continue to improve our relationships with one another and, and sharing God's grace and love throughout. We're going to close our worship today with number 687, and if you're someone who's not dedicated your life to Christ and you're feeling called to do that today, or if you're feeling called to do a transfer of membership into this congregation or create a new membership, we would welcome you as we sing, In Christ There Is No East or West. <laughs> All God's people say, Amen. Amen.
want to give you.